All right, I am Derek Johnson from Amplitude's customer success team. I'm going to be your MC for the rest of this afternoon. Thank you, COVID, I really appreciate that. Arjun couldn't make it. Uh, but I've had the pleasure of working with a lot of you over the last year. I'm very excited to see you guys in person. Uh, but let's, let's keep it real. It's been a trying uh, couple of years. Don't really want to get into it. Uh, but you know, being together today is really making me excited. I've learned a lot at Amplify. But I think it's safe to admit that the term data-driven has become a bit of a buzzword, right? So we all agree that it sounds great in, 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 you know, in, in practice, but uh, you know, there's a lot of confusion about what it really means. So our next speaker, Alex, Alex Cohen at Carbon Health, is going to break it down for us and school everyone on how to scale your products team to uh, zero from one. Alex, come on out, man. All right. I think we're still waiting on a clicker because there are slides, so we'll see how it goes. So, hey everyone, I'm a little bit rusty. It's been a few years since I've spoken in front of a live crowd. Everything's just been faces on Zoom. Um, but excited to go through today and talk a bit about how we've scaled our analytics and instrumentation at Carbon Health. Okay, let's try this. All right, there we go. Um, so I've been at Carbon now for about a year and a half. I'm our senior director of product on our uh, consumer app team. And uh, going to take you through what we've done in terms of scaling from zero to one with all of our products and, and instrumenting everything and figuring out what our patients are doing, what our providers are doing, um, especially now as we've scaled to millions of patients per year in a pretty big operation. So for some background, I joined Carbon back in February of 2021. For those of you who remember, this is when vaccines were first rolled out, and we had won a couple of really big contracts with the state of California to do uh, drive-through vaccinations. So we basically took over airports, we took over big parking lots, and people were driving through, getting shots in arms, and we vaccinated about a million and a half people in just a few months. And the first project I ever worked on was just vaccine tooling. So how do you give providers a way to actually log that someone was vaccinated and report it back to the state? Um, and then in April, I started to actually do what I was hired to do, which was run our productivity pod. And productivity at Carbon Health means uh, internal tooling for all of our staff that are not directly serving care to patients. So these are folks like our support teams, nurse admin teams, operations. They all need tools in order to, to help provide care to our patients every day. Um, but one of the biggest things that we did not have for the longest time was actual analytics and instrumentation on both our patient apps and our provider apps. And so in June, uh, we took on a pretty big initiative to add instrumentation to all of our apps at Carbon. And then in August, it went live. And, uh, and then most recently in December, I ended up taking over our consumer team and then had to do the same thing on the consumer app and figure out um, how we were going to track and see what our consumers were doing. So, and then here we are today. So a little bit about Carbon Health. For those of you who don't know us, we've got about 125 actual physical uh, clinics throughout the country. So we provide full stack health care. That means primary care, urgent care, virtual care, care programs for, for things like diabetes and asthma and other chronic conditions. Um, and then we work with a lot of employers to provide on-site care. So we are full stack end to end. We do everything in house. So the providers work for Carbon. Our R&D team's a part of Carbon. We're not using any external EHRs. Um, and we're about 3,000 employees last time I checked. Um, and just to put our scale into perspective, last year we saw over 2 million patients. Uh, each month we get tens of thousands of downloads on the App Store for our, for our patient app. And then about 80% of our patients actually download the app to get access to their care. So that would be pre-visit when they're checking in and actually scheduling an appointment. Um, to post-visit when they need to get their x-rays or their lab results or other medical records. And so. Um, the app is really a core piece of everything that we do, and that's what my team works on every single day. Um, so to talk a little bit about our apps at Carbon, so we have the patient app, which is what you can see in this screenshot here. Uh, your medical images live in there, your upcoming appointments, your lab results, you can chat with providers. I mean, it's really comprehensive. Uh, we have TV apps that are inside the clinics as well, so when you go in, uh, we have waiting rooms, uh, TVs in our waiting rooms to show who's up next and who's getting taken to the back to be triaged. We have TVs inside of the actual clinic rooms to show uh, which provider you're going to be seeing and other contextual pieces related to your visit. And then we have the provider app. So we've built an entire EHR from scratch. Um, 
it's a pretty big operation. I mean, having to do everything from letting providers actually take notes and triage patients to having an entire scheduling operation in-house. Um, we also do some hardware. Uh, we just piloted a, vend a prescription vending machine in one of our clinics in California, so that means you don't actually have to go to a pharmacy now to get your prescriptions after a visit. You can walk up to a vending machine, type in your information, pay 10 bucks, and then the prescription gets spit out and you can go on with your day. Um, we also do some stuff with CGM, so continuous glucose monitoring, and then we've got more hardware coming soon, which I can't talk about today. Um, and, then, uh, and then we're expanding all of our chronic condition programs. So right now we, we do a really good job of taking care of patients with diabetes uh, remotely, and we're adding in programs for asthma and COPD and hypertension and a whole bunch of other chronic care. So um, I'll start by talking a bit about our patient app. And um, in the context of this event and, and analytics and instrumentation, uh, we actually for a long time didn't actually know what patients were doing inside of the app. We had hundreds of thousands of downloads and we thought people were using it, but we really didn't know. Um, and these are events like patients who wanna make appointments inside the app or they wanna chat with their provider. Um, we just recently released a feature where you get a personalized to-do list before and after your visit uh, that's custom for your care. So those are things like, hey, you need to actually fill this prescription or you need to book a follow-up appointment. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of other features within the app for doing things like filling your prescriptions, viewing your medical images, uh, understanding what your vitals mean and more. And so then on the other side, this is what our providers use every day. So again, most healthcare providers or even digital health companies that you'll see will use something like Athena or Epic or, or any of the big EHRs. Uh, and we decided to build it from scratch for, for better or for worse. But now it's good. It was a long five years of building an EHR from scratch for anyone that's ever worked in digital health would know. Um, but for example, a patient now can come in if they've got a UTI in this example and, uh, and everything is contextual for thousands and thousands of different types of appointment reasons. Um, and then on the right hand side of this uh, screenshot, you can see what a scheduling view looks like for our front desk and the support staff who actually triage patients when they walk into a clinic. Um, cool, and so now on to, I guess, the whole purpose of this talk of how we actually added analytics and instrumentation to our apps. Um, we had millions of people using the apps and we really didn't know what they were doing. We didn't have analytics, we couldn't run funnel analysis or charts or actually see uh, how often patients were coming back to the app to schedule follow-up appointments. Um, and this is one of the things where my boss, Io, basically said, go figure this out. We need analytics. We're building in the dark. And we had an idea of what patients were doing. I think you know we were running off of intuition. Uh, we kind of assumed that they were using the features we had built. Um, but even on the provider side, we didn't know how long it was taking a provider to chart or to actually check someone in or check someone out. And so we just needed to, to figure, all, figure all these things out and answer those questions. Um, and cool, so now we have a rule. It's don't ship shit without instrumentation. Um, to the point where we have literally asked teams to roll back feature releases if they haven't instrumented certain events inside of the app. Um, and I think this is really important. It's, it's actually one of the things that helps every single team, because we operate in, in the structure of pods, operate uh, with analytics in mind first. And what this means is like, I don't have to worry that another team is actually going to wire up events because if they don't, we're gonna ask them to roll back their, their feature release. And so I think this is really important when you're setting a culture, at least in a product org, of how do you make sure that everyone is following the same processes and guidelines and, and all operating with analytics and, and event tracking in mind. Having a really important rule to anchor on is important. Cool. So I'll start with uh, why we track. So I think this is fairly obvious, but without instrumentation, we really don't know if what we shipped is working, if people are using it, how often they're using it, what are the most common events. Um, and the way that I like to think about it is when you don't have instrumentation and you're sort of building in the dark, it means that you're operating off of intuition-based decisions or gut-based decisions instead of data-driven decisions. I think there is a spectrum here where I definitely do not lean on the far end of the spectrum of it has to be a data-driven decision and whatever the data tells us is what we're building. Um, I also don't think things should be 100% an intuition-based decision. I think there's something in the middle where we think we know what to build and we have high conviction around what we're building. Um, and the data should support that in some capacity. But if we're just, we were for a long time just thinking we think patients need this or we think this 
funnel needs to be optimized, and we didn't really know if it should have been. And so now, uh, we have pretty standardized PRDs, uh, product requirement docs, at Carbon now. And each one of our documents has a section for instrumentation. I mean, there's literally a template that you can go into and say, I want to track this event. And here's the naming convention for this event. And here's why we are, uh, here's why we're tracking it. And whenever we're thinking about products to develop or features to develop, um, we document what our goals are, what analytics we need to actually support these goals, and then what success looks like. And so to give you an example, we recently launched personalized to-do lists for patients, uh, which I mentioned a few minutes ago. And for that, we wanted to track how many patients were seeing this, uh, this little icon with a badge inside of the app, how many were tapping into it, and from there, how many were actually clicking on a to-do item, completing that item, and, um, and how they were doing it. We have a manual completion and then an automated completion. And so when we started writing the specs for this, uh, for this feature, we went through every single uh, place in the Figma design and said, this is an event, this is an event, this is an event. And then for these goals, like are people actually using this feature, here's the funnel that we need to build, here's the events that support it. Um, and then when we went live a few weeks ago, we actually had a dashboard already set up within Amplitude to show conversion rates over time for the feature. So preparation's a big piece. Um, how we execute on this, so product and engineering work really closely. Um, we define it in the specs. Engineering will tell us, like, we can't do it this way or we can do it that way. Um, but everything's documented, so by the time it actually gets built alongside the feature, we know we're going to have the events inside of Amplitude ready to go. And this is really important because we've definitely missed a lot of events uh, setting up features in the last few months. And we can catch it pretty early and make sure it's there before we go live. Cool. And then monitoring all happens within Amplitude. So uh, we've got a whole bunch of dashboards. Each team has different folders within Amplitude to organize their dashboards and different features and events that we're tracking. Um, and each big product launch has a dashboard that we can go back to and say, what's the success? What does this look like over time? And then, and then uh, we can see if we're tracking towards those goals. And lastly, so uh, how we iterate. So we, now we finally make changes based on what the data is actually telling us. And so with our to-do list, using that same example, um, conversion rate's actually pretty good, but we think it can be better. And uh, the only reason that we know what the conversion is from someone who sees this little tab to taps into it and then actually completes an action item uh, is in our amplitude dashboard. And so we now can think about what changes we need to make to drive that conversion higher, whether it's push notifications, whether it's actually a larger icon, whether it's adding in um, other places in the app that we can show that you have a couple of actionables that are unread. Um, and then with each new release, we track the outcomes and it's just a continuous cycle over and over and over again. Um, and so we finally have data to support a lot of the decisions that we're making on the product team. And that's all I have for today. We have some time left, so I figured I'd open it up to Q&A if anyone has questions versus just keep talking for the next uh, 10 minutes with a slide deck. That's it. Hi, you mentioned you have a robust suite of internal apps, and in your uh, slide about instrumentation, you had instrumentation for, I think, two in addition to consumer. How do you instrument your internal apps? that your colleagues and teammates are using to do the work that they do? Yeah, good question. So Chris, who's right here in another white shirt, um, he's, he leads our productivity pod now, which is all those internal tools. And, um, and with any of those, so for example, we're building more robust faxing inside of the app because healthcare still runs on fax in the year 2022, um, or things like uh, referral management. Um, it's very similar in terms of the patient app where our internal teams also have goals that they're building towards, and that would be, for example, number of touch points that it takes to get a release of records back from a, a provider, um, or number of touch points that it takes to actually complete a support issue. And so as we're building internal tools for an ops team or support team or anyone else who needs that, um, it's the same process, just a different user, and obviously less, like we've got millions of, of patients, we've got only hundreds or thousands of staff who are using internal tools, but, uh, that's essentially how we're going to build it as well for the internal tooling piece. I will say with internal tools, it's a lot easier to get feedback. We can just ask our colleagues, which is a really unique part of the job, and say, Dr. So-and-so or this person on the ops team, like, what do you think of this feature? What do you think we should build? Or what's broken in your workflow? 
Um, we don't get that luxury with, uh, with patients as often as we do with providers and other staff. Question. Yeah, so um, we're a pretty small product. So the question for anyone who couldn't hear was how we manage our tracking plans and if there's a team that owns the tracking plan or if we work with our data scientists or data analytics team on that. Um, we're actually a really small product team for the size company, right? I think we're maybe 20 or 25 people total. That includes technical program managers as well. The data science team is about six people. So we worked really closely with them when we set up. Uh, amplitude to begin with, and like the right data taxonomy, we've got a centralized place where every single event lives. Um, there, I would say a mix of the productivity pod, which is Chris's team here, and then data science, uh, sort of own that in collaboration. There isn't necessarily an approval process that we go through to say, hey, like, can we wire up this event? Um, but data science actually reviews if our naming convention is right or if we have duplicative events. And so there is somewhat of a process that we go through to make sure that we're not duplicating work and that things are standardized. Um, but each team is at, a, at their own liberty to, to wire up the events they think they need. Um, and data science usually helps us make sure that we aren't you know, rebuilding the wheel. Cool. Oh, another question. Okay, it's on. Um, so with regards to the iteration, um, how should a company, at least um, for my company, we're a smaller company, um, and we're trying to figure out how we should operationalize iterating with data insights. Like, how, how would a company go about operationalizing that to make sure you're doing the right you know, amount of touch points to look at this data and who you should be discussing with that and then how that actually turns into like new user stories or tickets? Yeah. So um, before Carbon, I came from only startups. Like five to 120 people was basically the range of company that I worked for before joining Carbon. We were about 200 when I joined Carbon. We're now three, oh, we're about 800 in HQ. So it's been a big jump. But in every single role before Carbon, I've overemphasized on getting instrumentation and analytics done right before we actually had users to go and see what they were doing. Um, Carbon was the first place that I had joined or, or that I worked with where we had all these users who were using the product and we had no instrumentation. Um, my recommendation to most earlier stage smaller companies now is um, it's actually okay to not have as robust instrumentation as you think you need. I think what's most important is that people are using it and you can always, it's a lot better to have a problem where you need to instrument because enough people are using it and you want to make changes than it is to spend months and months getting it set up or making sure that you have the right funnels and the right events only to realize that no one's there to begin with. Um, so I think there's a balance like setting it up and, and having the infrastructure but not spending so much time on it to get it perfect. So you said that you believe in a compromise between what data tells you and what your gut feeling tells you. So has there been any case, like can you give an example where you acted against what data was telling you? Yeah, I would say the growth team definitely, we have this you know, point of contention often where we think we need to optimize a, a scheduling booking flow. And the data probably tells us that there's a drop off somewhere in that flow that can be worked on and, um, and, and improved. But there's still a lot of room, I think, for intuition where, for example, when we put on our, our patient experience hat in regards to those conversations, um, there's a lot of stuff that doesn't need to be experimented or, or that just needs to be fixed. And uh, I don't have good specific examples of where we've had arguments about this so far, but uh, I do think that there are teams who have a tendency to focus 100% on what conversions are, um, where we can optimize and what the data is telling us. And then we're looking at it from, well, we still have really high conviction that there is a better way of doing this and we don't need to look at the data to tell us that. Um, one of this, play, like if you ever sign up for Carbon and, and add your insurance details, it's not a great flow today. We're working on it. So, um, and insurance is really hard, just generally. I mean, there's thousands of insurance plans and doing real-time verification is a mess, but 
it's just one of those places where we could use the data and say, like, what's the drop off? Are people adding insurance properly? But I don't actually think it matters because it just sucks. It's not a good experience right now. And that's one of those places where I would say, let's, let's skip over even looking at what, it, what the conversion rates are in that funnel and just build a better experience of adding insurance to your, to your account. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have a question here. Um, the question is really about, you know, there's certain features that you already have, and then you're trying to use the data to improve the delivery of those features. And then there's potential features. You mentioned the referral kind of workflow. Um, when do you, how do you decide that maybe you need to build something net new that you don't have any data on? That's a good question. I think that there is always some data that you can capture. It might not be explicit in a chart uh, that you can say, like, there's a 1,000 people who have used this, and, and it takes 15 steps. But I think if you go digging hard enough, you can typically find even anecdotal data points that, that, that you can use. So in, the, in that specific example, um, we'll just go ask the team that's doing all the requests for records or referrals and say, what are you doing today? And they're probably using a Google Sheet and making a bunch of phone calls and sending manual faxes, and you can just talk to three of those folks, and it's the same repetitive process, um, and kind of get a sense that we need to build something in, in, in here that actually fixes that issue. But we wouldn't have any data, because like, we don't have Google Sheets instrumented, and we don't have those flows instrumented. And so um, I think in a lot of cases, there are still always creative places to look to validate that assumption that something needs to be built there, even if it's not explicit uh, inside the app. Yeah, question here. Um, when you first kicked off instrumentation at Carbon, were there any things that either just didn't work or didn't quite go as planned? And what are uh, some things you learned from that experience? Yeah, um, a lot. <laughs> so we definitely had, I think, too many people around the table to start in terms of making decisions on what we were going to instrument to begin with, um, the naming convention, like how we were going to actually set up all the infrastructure behind it. I really believe in like a small team should just have authority and ownership over that process and the other team should conform to it, especially in, in a case like this. We probably could have sped up a lot of our early work by a month or two when we went through initial implementation just by saying, you know, this person's done it before at TaskRabbit or wherever they worked previously um, and it worked and they did it well, like, let's, let's not reinvent the wheel. And we should have had a smaller team, I think, making decisions over our, our initial, uh, initial project versus I think we probably had some meetings with 10 or 12 people trying to decide what we were going to instrument, what tool we were going to use, what the naming, like, all the nitty gritty details, I think, should have been ironed out by a much smaller team. We eventually got there just in the beginning. We made, we made a lot of mistakes, I think, around bringing too many people in on those decisions. Uh, have you ever been a part of an organization where there had already been policies in place uh, around instrumentation and you kind of came in and you said, well, these aren't good. <laughs> let's, let's go at it again. And how did you go about that? Or, or how would you go about that if you haven't done that before? Um, so the quick answer is no. I haven't been in that situation where I had to come in and say, like, we're doing this incorrectly. But I think, like, if I were to, if, if that were to be a hypothetical scenario, you join somewhere and, like, instrumentation is just not a working or usable thing. Um, I think it's, it's, it's okay and sensible to say, like, we need to rebuild this from the ground up, um, especially there's, there's enough tool, Amplitude being one of them, like enough tools to use and enough tried and true processes of understanding and getting access to your data that, it, that it's reasonable to say, like, hey, wait, maybe we have the events, maybe they're stored somewhere, maybe Amplitude's doing it all for us, but um, we're doing it all incorrectly. I, I think it's okay to come in with a really strong, convicted decision around, uh, let's just build it correctly and build it right. It'll pay dividends in the long run versus trying to conform or, or adapt to something that's just broken already. Hi. Um, have you ever had to deal with HIPAA regulations uh, around this instrumentation when sending all this data back to Amplitude and uh, maybe like CCPA or GDPR, stuff like that? 
Yeah, we've had <laughs> HIPAA's the bane of my existence. I mean, <laughs> everything that we do, uh, you know, especially when it comes to patient data, the provider stuff's a little bit easier because it's all internal, but uh, and there's nothing, nothing there with their medical records. But with patients, um, yeah, that was actually one of the bigger parts of this early setup with with getting our patient app instrumented was. We went through a really rigorous exercise to figure out what was the minimum amount of data that we needed to collect on a patient in order to understand and aggregate what people were doing in the app. Um, I will say we don't really care what individuals are doing. Like if someone has a medical condition, how often they're using the app, it's not important, at least when it comes to us making product decisions. But uh, so we stripped away anything that was identifiable for a patient and um, you know, almost to the extent where we wouldn't even need a BAA in this case uh, with the limited amount of data that we're collecting. But I think it's one of the biggest challenges, at least in healthcare, is figuring out what tools you can use, um, especially when it comes to understanding what your end consumers who are always patients are doing. It's, uh, it's always a challenge and we run into it with every single vendor that we select. Amplitude and data analytics in general were one of the biggest hurdles we had to get over in order to get something workable and set up. And I think I'm good on time now. That's it.